Hi, welcome back from spring break. I hope you all had a chance to take a bit of a break and hopefully um, do whatever you wanted. So before we left for spring break, we began a new section of the course, which is looking at different cultures throughout time and space. How have different societies interacted with their environments, managed their resources, and has it been sustainable or not? What can we learn from these different case studies, these different societies throughout space and time in terms of sustainability? Environmental degradation is not an inevitable or natural outcome of human populations. It's a result of specific sociocultural organizations. And so today we'll go ahead and pick up where we left off, which was this case study of the Maya. We'll recap that, which will get us into a concept I wanna talk about called resiliency. And then we'll look at another example of a different type of society in Bali, Indonesia, something called rice-based polyculture. So just to recap where we left off talking about sustainability in different types of societies throughout space and time, we were looking at human environment interaction in complex farming societies with this case study of the classic Maya, which existed about a thousand years um, BCE to 1500 years current era. And so we looked at two different sides of the story surrounding what happened to the classic Maya. First, Jared Diamond's interpretation about what happened to the Maya. He explores evidence that says essentially the classic Maya collapsed. They were running up against environmental limitations in the context of a growing population and were producing less food at a time when more was needed. Also, because 70% of the diet was based off corn, uh, people aren't producing enough food, you start to see malnutrition, evidence for malnutrition in the archaeological record. Um, on top of that, he also mentions drought, also deforestation, other environmental changes that exacerbate the food problem, the resource shortage problem. And on top of that, he also points out the Maya leaders, the kings and nobles, failed to solve the people's problems, whether social or environmental. Uh, he argues essentially that the elites, if you will, the kings, were more concerned with their own short-term aggrandizement, their own personal interests rather than dealing with the mounting social and environmental problems facing the Maya. And eventually this led to the Maya's collapse. Diamond's kind of warning us, if you will. His, his case study of the Maya is a warning to us today, um, where we see many par parallels. We're running up against environmental limitations, many would argue. Uh, we have population growth, and many would also argue our leaders, our elites, both political and economic, are failing to solve the problems the majority of the people here face. Uh, so he's warning us um, from a lesson from the past. McEnany and Negron, uh, two scholars that wrote a response basically to Diamond's argument, they say something else happened to the Maya. That they say they didn't collapse. They suggest a different outcome. The Maya didn't collapse, but they actually changed. They adapted to the changing circumstances around them. And so they would actually say, Diamond is, they accuse Diamond of retrofitting the present onto the past to make his argument. And no matter how badly we may need to heed these warning signs, these lessons, um, we need to be careful not to retrofit our current circumstances onto past societies. That we don't know that the Maya leaders didn't care about their people. That's a huge, huge assumption. And so they would argue, McEnany and Negron, the Maya didn't collapse. They actually represent a highly resilient society that adapted to the changing circumstances around them. Uh, one of the reasons you see this disappearance of monumental architecture, these large centralized urban centers, is not because the Maya collapsed, but because the way they were organizing their culture, their society, change. You see a shift away from the centralized hierarchy and monumental architecture towards mercantile activity, trade. They became more immersed in trade and you see new architectural forms and settlement locations that start to pop up that reflect increasing trade activity. So they're no longer concerned with monumental architecture, these large hierarchical centers. Um, also, the, the depopulation in the south that Diamond talks about as evidence of the collapse, this coincides with increases of population in the north. Um, 
Also, the north tends to be more coastally oriented, so it would make sense that sites would be located, post-classic Maya sites would be located here rather in the south. And McEnany and Nagarin sort of give this example of Tulum. And so they would say that the Maya did not collapse. In fact, today there's nearly 7 million Maya still alive. Is that collapse? They changed. Instead of representing environmental degradation, they actually represent a successful strategy of long-term resilience. They were not sort of passive victims of changing environmental circumstances. They reacted and adapted to the environment around them. Um, and so this highlights this concept of resilience. The Maya reflect resiliency, the ability of a system, whether social or ecological, to absorb disturbance, shocks to the system, unexpected changes, and still retain its basic function and structure. They would say the Maya and what happened to them doesn't represent environmental degradation. They actively manage their environment, and there's lots of more recent evidence to show this. And so Mayan, uh, excuse me, McEnany and Negron sort of summarize their argument. They say the past can inform us and often guide us towards a better future. But the mirror of ancient Maya society should not be refracted in hopes of inducing change in the contemporary world, no matter how badly change might be needed. The Maya didn't collapse. They changed. They were a very resilient society. And I actually think this is a more hopeful lesson for the present, right? We don't have to collapse. We don't have to disintegrate. We can change. We can adapt in a way that maybe works better for more people in our societies as well. And so the Maya case highlights several important issues, one of which is resiliency. Again, resilience is the ability of social systems and ecosystems to continue functioning despite severe and unexpected stress. Um, weeds actually are an excellent example of resiliency and what we mean by that. Weeds are designed by evolution to survive and thrive in marginal and disturbed environments that often experience unexpected stress. So there's this really cool book, um, Weeds, in Defense of Nature's Most Unloved Plants, written by this English nature writer, Richard Maybe. And so just to a few uh, things he says, a few things from his book about weeds and why they reflect this concept of resiliency. The plants, weeds, that obstruct our plans or our tidy maps of the world are weeds. The difference between weeds and what might be termed respectable plants is not so much botanical in nature, but the result of human judgments on their respective value. Weeds grow where they are unwanted and crowd out the plants we deem valuable, such as crops and ornamental flowers, or weeds mar meticulously planned gardens. Uh, the writer calls weeds trespassers, vegetable gorillas, outlaws, and botanical fifth colonists. They are relentless opportunists that adapt and thrive where other plants cannot. They persist and adapt in environments they find themselves in and the clever ways they go about doing it. They are unfussy about where they live, adapt quickly to environmental stress, use multiple strategies for getting their own way. It's curious that it took so long for us to realize that the species they most resemble is us. It has long been said that the only survivors of nuclear war will be cockroaches. I'd put my money on weeds. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the writer doesn't talk just about the greatness of weeds. Um, he also says that a lot of them are really ugly. Um, he goes on to say, more serious is the rampant growth of super weeds, such as kudzu, that are glyphosate resistant, meaning these weeds have grown to be tolerant of Roundup, these herbicides that we spray uh, to kill weeds so that we can get higher yields from our crops. Super weeds spread from continent to continent and are frightening in not only their destructiveness and refusal to be controlled, but in some cases their grotesque size. For example, horseweed grows to six feet high and Palmer amaranth, remember the pigweed we talked about that grows alongside Roundup ready cotton uh, and is resistant to Roundup now, pig weed reaches eight feet high while developing a stem so tough it can damage farm machinery. Sound like a monster movie? In a desperate effort to halt the invasion of super weeds, newer herbicides have been developed, some of which even use components of the notorious agent orange, right? These poison chemical agents that we use to kill people. That's part of the chemicals that we're pouring on plants and the food that we eat. 
Um, a few more things. So how did weeds acquire their tenacity? This is getting into why they're so resilient. Why do they survive in places that are alien to the rest of the botanical world? One reason is they originated in places of continual disturbance where adapting to such conditions was necessary for survival. Weeds, he writes, evolved on tide pounded beaches and the precarious slopes of volcanoes in the flood zones at the edges of rivers and muddy wallows made by grazing animals in glacial moraines. No wonder weeds are tough cookies. Plants that live in such turbulent and unstable conditions must develop special characteristics to survive. As a consequence of their background, many weeds germinate quickly and have expedited life cycles, meaning that they reproduce very quickly. They jump at a brief window of life while spreading prodigious numbers of seeds. Um, some plants release millions of seeds a day just to reproduce and the chance that hopefully a few of those seeds will make it. Some seeds have barbs that catch onto passing animals and spread wherever the animal travels. Other seeds lie dormant for remarkably long periods of time and eventually germinate when conditions are right. For example, species not seen for decades sprouted in the rubble created by German bombing of London in World War II. Even more remarkable, a recent archeological dig in the UK at ancient Roman sites uh, prompted these dormant seeds that have been buried in the archaeology to sprout up and start growing even though they were over 2,000 years old and had been dormant for 2,000 years. Um, think about if a seed company marketed packets of weeds. What, what would they say they use by dates? Um, best if used by July 4,017, right, 2,000 years from now. Remarkably adaptable and resilient. Um, lastly, through natural selection over countless growing seasons, some weeds mimic the appearance of neighboring crops to ensure that their seeds are harvested along with the host crops. For example, in Southeast Asia, weed grasses have become indistinguishable from rice. Uh, so that when someone comes and harvests rice, they can't tell the difference between the rice plants they want to grow and the weeds that have evolved to grow to look exactly like the rice. So all of it gets harvested meaning the weed seeds uh, get spread and germinated along with the rice. <clears throat> uh, in the case of wheat, cutting it every autumn with a sickle perpetuated weeds whose seeds were produced at the same height as the wheat ear. So by cutting wheat the same at the same height again and again, weeds evolved to mimic that height. Um, and so then when we go to sieve the grains to chop down the wheat, uh, the weeds get cut down with it because they're they're mimicking what the wheat looks like. They're hiding within it. The use of herbicides actually end up benefiting weeds by increasing their tolerance to them. Spraying tons of Agent Orange on rainforests in Vietnam, which we did during the Vietnam War, killed the trees but allowed a tough grass called Kogon to flourish in their place. Once checked by the forest shady canopy, um, the shade from the trees kept the weeds in check. Now that the trees are gone, this grass Kogon thrives in De Vietnam's defoliated landscapes. Uh, and in spite of their astonishing resilience and contributions to the health of the planet, such as retaining topsoil, remember weeds prevent erosion, weeds remain a tough sell for people. Uh, think mosquitoes and think viruses. The fact that something is adaptable and tenacious does not make it endearing. Flowers and shrubs, on the other hand, may be wimpy in comparison to weeds, but they are far easier to love. So the point, um, all these different examples of how weeds grow, how they germinate and reproduce, they're incredibly resilient. They have evolved so that they can survive in marginal and capricious environments. And think about it, you can destroy entire ecosystems. You can rip down a whole housing complex. It does not take very long for weeds to start popping up in the cracks. Um, resilience, the ability to continue functioning despite severe and unexpected stress. So there's two strategies to achieve resiliency in social and ecological systems. The first is to build in redundancy and flexibility into the system. So redundancy, meaning uh, duplica duplication and diversification of function to provide backups for when things go wrong. 
Um, so redundancy, there's there's backups built in. So the picture, push this button, wait for answer. If no answer, push this button. Um, modern technology has a lot of redundancy built into it. This is especially conspicuous in the design of spacecraft. Um, spaceships have extensive backup systems to replace parts of the spacecraft that fail to function properly. So that you're up in space and one thing goes wrong, one of the pieces of machinery doesn't work, that's okay, you have a backup. You have redundancy built into the system to provide for backups when things go wrong. Uh, this principle also of redundancy is built into natural ecosystems. It's prominent in natural ecosystems. Um, redundancy is built in through multiple different species of plants and animals that have overlapping ecological niches and roles. So if one thing happens to a particular species in that environment, um, that's okay. There's other species that fulfill that same role, whether it's recycling waste, producing fertility, um, spreading seeds, whatever it may be. There's lots of biodiversity naturally occurring in ecosystems, and so there's multiple species to fill these niches. There's redundancy built in. It makes the system flexible. Um, things can sort of happen um, unexpectedly, and that's okay. The system can withstand it. It's, it's flexible. It can... It, 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 <laughs> It can withstand stress. I'll give you some examples in a minute to sort of clarify what I'm saying. <clears throat> so redundancy and flexibility, building this into our systems is one way to achieve resiliency. And the other main strategy to achieve resilience is having low dependence on human inputs. So in other words, let nature do the work. Um, this is sort of similar when we talked about agroecology, modeling agricultural systems off of ecological principles. Um, do cover cropping, do intercropping, grow corn and then grow legumes, which naturally put nitrogen fertilizer back into the soil and then grow corn again, right? Use nature, let it do the work. So low dependence on human inputs uh, creates resiliency. Once you start to put large human inputs into a system, it becomes less resilient because sooner or later, something is going to happen that is going to interfere with that input whether it's large amounts of fossil fuels being burned to produce electricity to create lighting or air conditioning or heating. Um, that's great, it creates a highly stable system, um, but eventually something is gonna go wrong with that supply, that input of fossil fuels, either in terms of humans not being able to exploit the resource anymore, maybe everyone gets sick, or maybe we run out of oil, or maybe the countries that have oil change oil prices and policy. Um, as soon as something interferes with that input, things can go wrong. Um, the system is not resilient. <clears throat> Think about right now, for example, if the internet crashed. If we are all, no matter what we do, relying essentially on the internet right now during this shelter in place from the COVID virus. Um, so imagine if something interfered with the internet. It would literally shut down so much of what we're doing. It's a highly stable system. We can rely on internet to do our work, to communicate, to do all these other things most of the time. But if something interferes with that input, that consistent access to internet, uh, there's we don't have a lot of backup or redundancy built in. So ex for example, actually last week I woke up and my internet had become obsolete overnight. AT&T did some sort of update and literally made my modem obsolete. Uh, it didn't work anymore. Um, so something went wrong, interfered with this input, um, and I was sort of shit out of luck. Luckily, in my case, I had some resiliency built in to my own situation um, through social networks. So I was able to drive to a dirty alley in North Park and borrow my friend's internet while I was parked in my car outside her house. Um, the next day I was able to hook into my neighbor's Wi-Fi. And so there was, there was backups, there was flexibility available to me through my social network um, to provide for a backup when something went wrong, my internet no longer worked. So large scale, complex food producing agricultural societies typically require large amounts of human inputs, um, whether that's fossil fuels, whether that's human labor, it relies on large amounts of inputs and they typically also become more specialized over time, right? Think um, hunting and gathering, everyone's involved in food procurement, gathering, hunting versus agricultural societies. Only a portion of the population is involved in producing food. Everyone else specializes in different types of occupations. 
And so complex societies are inherently less resilient than simple societies. Um, because of the high amount of specialization involved in complex societies and the large amount of inputs, human or other non-human energy inputs required to keep complex societies going, whether that's corn yield for the Maya or fossil fuel inputs uh, for the U.S., for example. And so resilience is desirable. Um, it, it Again, it creates flexibility. It allows uh, you to continue operating even when things go wrong, but it conflicts with other objectives that are equally desirable, like economic efficiency, for example. So in modern economic enterprises or global capitalism, economic efficiency is desirable because it reduces unwanted costs and therefore increases profits. Um, however, the, the reduced costs associated with reducing uh by lowering, by lowering your operating costs and getting rid of all this extra redundant stuff that's not really necessary, it also makes the system less resilient once something goes wrong. Okay, so again, resilience is desirable, uh, but it can conflict with other social objectives like efficiency or economic efficiency. An example real quick related to the current COVID crisis um, one, some are arguing one reason the U.S.'s response has been somewhat problematic. For example, let's just take a lack of having tests uh, to test whether patients are positive with COVID or not. Well, one potential reason for that is because over the last three years or so, many of the experts, both scientific and medical, involved in planning for things uh, like pandemics in the CDC or National Resource Defense Council or national public health agencies that we have uh, involved in our government, most of these positions had been essentially eliminated, not filled. It reduces undesirable costs associated with paying for these people, paying for these experts. Uh, so it's more economically efficient. You're saving money. But then when something goes wrong where you actually need these experts that provide this resiliency for you, um, that know how to deal with pandemics, know what needs to be done. Um, when something goes wrong, like COVID coming over to the US, we don't have that redundancy built in. We don't have all these backups and experts and specialization to help deal with this crisis now that it's happened. It was economically efficient at the time in the Trump administration to get rid of many of these positions. It saved money. Um, but it reduces resiliency, and now we're much worse off than we would have been had we had those experts in place when this first started back in January. And so you see there's a trade-off between stability, um, makes things efficient, highly stable, very reliable, and consistent. Um, that's good for things like economic efficiency. But the, the more stable something is, the less resilient it becomes. Let me give you sort of a different example. Um, look at the graphic on the bottom of the slide. Look to the right. So in, um, in this situation, the sort of ball in the bottom of the basin is, let's just take an individual in this case. And let's say um, it's a highly stable system. Uh, this individual receives a paycheck every month. Um, same amount, same day, highly stable, completely reliable, right? Um, it's However, not a resilient system. If something goes wrong to interfere with that paycheck, that little ball in the bottom of the basin, um, the paycheck comes co so consistently, it's so reliable that this individual, when something interferes with that paycheck, doesn't really have anything to fall back on, right? Because they're so such a stable, reliable income via the paycheck. If you look over to the left, um, let's sort of flip the situation. Say this individual does not receive a paycheck every month. Sometimes they do, it depends on what job they're working, um, but this is typical for them. Um, and so they have all these other backups built in. For example, they also are independent contractors and they also work on fixing personal computers. Um, they also do Uber or Lyft on months when they're not working their regular job. They also have a family and social support network that's able to loan them money during months when they don't have a good, uh, find a good job, right? So it might be less desirable, it's less stable, you don't have this reliable paycheck every month, but because of that, it also makes the person more resilient, right? They have backups, redundancy built into their life to provide for them when things don't go right. Um, so the more stability, the less resilience, 
the more resilience, the less stability. And so again, in complex specialized societies like our own, uh, the extra cost that goes into building redundancy and resiliency into the system, that's often cut out. Results in highly stable systems, but not resilient ones. And so stability implies constancy, right? Uh, things are consistent, more or less, if they're stable. But again, because they're so consistent, the system never exercises its ability to withstand shocks, and it's therefore not resilient. So modern technology and large inputs of fossil fuel energy have given contemporary society the ability to build a high degree of stability into our lives. Um, by insulating us from fluctuations in the environment. So we rely on large inputs of fossil fuels to create le electricity to heat and cool our homes and the buildings we work in year round. We rely on the modern system of food production and distribution, which relies on huge energy inputs to stock our supermarkets and our, and our homes with food all the time. Um, that's great. We, we can eat different produce year round. We can stay warm in our houses, even though it's freezing cold outside. It creates stability. That's nice. The weakness of depending on these large energy inputs for heating and cooling our buildings or producing our food is eventually something is going to interfere with that input. Eventually, something sooner or later is going to go wrong. So the example I have for you is a fuel oil shortage that happened a few years ago on the northeast coast of the U.S. Um, stability, <clears throat> high inputs, increased stability. They make things stable. They make the temperature the same year round. We can eat bananas and pineapples year round, but they reduce resilience. There's a trade-off. So a few years ago in the northeast coast of the U.S., there was a fuel oil shortage, um, an unexpected one. And so unlike here on the West Coast, where we sort of pay our utility bill to the power company, on the East Coast, most homes and water are heated via fuel oil. So you have to actually get your fuel oil tank filled up. And if you don't get it filled up, you don't have heat and you don't have hot water. And so a few years ago, they there was a shortage of fuel oil, so people couldn't get any and it also coincided with a really unusually cold snap of weather during the winter and the result of this fuel oil shortage this interference with this input during this extremely cold time was a lot more people died than usually would have uh, for example there was elderly people that never went outside when it was cold and so they didn't even have winter clothing so that when heating oil got when heating oil ran out and they were unable to heat their homes, they literally froze to death where they lived because they didn't have um, backups, anything to provide a backup for when that fuel oil didn't come through, you didn't have clothing. Um, other people didn't have social support networks or anyone else to call or rely on when this happened. And so again, the result was an unusually large number of people died uh, because they were so used to the stability brought on by the consistent fuel oil that when something interfered with it, they weren't able to withstand that shock to the system, right? They were vulnerable. They were not resilient. <clears throat> Another quick example, last fall at SDSU, sort of mid-semester, San Diego had a power outage. And so I showed up to teach this class and the whole room was pitch black. Um, and so we, we rely on electricity to light our classrooms, uh, control the temperature, provide, <coughs> excuse me, electricity for the computer, all that stuff. Um, something went wrong, interfered with the power input in San Diego, and we literally had to cancel class that day because it was such a stable system that this classroom didn't even have windows. We relied so consistently on electrical lighting to hold class that when that input disappeared, we literally couldn't hold class. Students didn't mind. I was kind of bummed. Um, so there's a trade-off between stability and resiliency, and complex societies, because of this, are inherently less resilient than simple ones. And so the Maya 
what enabled them to become a complex society, to build monumental architecture, create a writing system, create a calendrical system? And the answer is social complexity. They became more socially complex over time so that by the classic period, you see it in a culmination of this monumental architecture, the writing systems. What made this complexity possible? The answer is the division of labor brought about by agricultural surplus, right? Farming changes everything. It produces surplus. You now no longer need the majority of the population involved in producing food, just a small proportion producing food for everyone else, it frees everyone else up to specialize along different occupational lines. Eventually, over time, you start to get differences in social status, also differences in accumulation of wealth, and eventually different social classes, uh, a socially stratified society. Right? And so surplus is the root of social complexity it is what allows for all else and then all else that comes after, including centralization of power. And once started, the pattern is typically for complexity to continue increasing. So once a society starts to be more, become more complex, typically that complexity continues to increase. Um, however, there's diminishing returns. There, once a society has achieved a certain level of technological and social organization, you don't really get better results, right? There comes a point where more organization, more efficient technology uh, doesn't really result in more results. You start to get diminishing returns. Um, think, think bureaucracy as an example of why complexity doesn't necessarily mean better or more efficient. Almost all past complex societies have shown cycles of rise and decline like the Maya. And again, the whole point that we're highlighting is these trade-offs between specialization, the more specialized the society becomes, the less flexible it can be in withstanding shocks and disruptions, um, and a trade-off between stability, the more stable a society becomes through, through specialization and economic efficiency, the less resilient it becomes, um, the less able the society is to withstand or adapt to major pressures or changes in the systems. Because it's so stable, it never exercises its ability to, to adapt. So there's two paths to increasing, to agricultural intensification. Uh, the first we've already looked at, this is represented by the, the classic Maya, specialization and hierarchy. The other path to agricultural intensification, producing more food to feed more people, is known as smallholders. And this is sort of what the Maya shifted towards after the so-called collapse. These self-sufficient households that practice permanent intensive or diversified agriculture. They practice different types of farming, but it's not this centralized hierarchical farming system. It's uh, sort of self-sufficient households and regions farming for themselves and their own needs. And the classic example I have of smallholders for you, which we'll talk about for the rest of this lecture, is something called rice-based polyculture. And so the next example we'll look at of societies throughout time and space and how sustainable they have or have not been is in Bali, Indonesia, specifically looking at rice-based polyculture. And it's an example of a long-term, extremely productive and extremely sustainable farming system. Um, again, what can we learn from other groups of people? The way we're doing things in our culture isn't set in stone. It's not inevitable. It's a result of choices. And that means it can also be done differently and more sustainably. So what is rice-based polyculture? Um, so polyculture is in contrast to monoculture. Remember monoculture, growing one or two species essentially for sale on the market. It relies on specialized seed and also chemical inputs and fertilizer. Um, polyculture, in contrast, think poly, many, so you're growing multiple crops in the same space rather than just one monoculture. So in rice-based polyculture, they grow rice, but also other crops. And in this way, polyculture is an imitation of the diversity we find in natural ecosystems. Um, it avoids these large stands of single crops like wheat or corn uh, that have a real easy time, that are really susceptible to pests and ecological fluctuations. 
So there's advantages to polyculture uh, in contrast to monoculture, two specifically ones I want to talk about. First, this, di this biodiversity that's created by polyculture, it lowers the susceptibility of the crops to disease and pests. Um, so think about it in monoculture you have one species one one large standing of just one species it's very susceptible to the pests that feed off of it it provides a perfect breeding ground for these pests to flourish similar actually to um, the flu or or even coronavirus among the human populations and so if the, with the flu when the flu emerges each each year among human populations some people have immunity to it and some don't and so uh some of the people will be affected by the flu bug but not everyone in contrast with the coronavirus it's novel no one has ever been exposed to it and therefore no one has immunity to it and so when you introduce coronavirus into the human population all humans are identical in the sense that no one has any immunity to it. All are equally susceptible, and it's really, really easy for the virus to then spread through the population, through all these hosts that have no immunity. That's one of the reasons why social distancing is so important right now. So in the same way, in ecosystems, when they're naturally diverse or when polyculture occurs in contrast to monoculture, it lowers the plant's susceptibility to disease and pests because the field is mixed with multiple different species. If a particular disease or pest does come along, it's only going to affect one of the crops, um, not the entire field, because it's, there's more than one plant planted on that field. Um, and so it creates biodiversity. This is positive um, in the sense of lowering disease susceptibility, and it also creates more bio biodiversity, which creates habitats for other species. Um, so, for example, the diversity of the crops attracts other types of species, um, like ducks that come into the patties to eat the different pests that feed off of the rice. Uh, and so all these other species that get drawn into the rice-based polyculture also help to increase biodiversity um, recycle nutrients back into the system, recycle waste, improve the overall health of, of the system. Other aspects of rice-based polyculture. It's artificial uh, in the sense that it's constructed through human labor, labor. This is artificially constructed. People have to build it and maintain this terracing. Um, give it a week or two without any human labor and these, these amazing terrace hillsides will just turn into muddy hill slopes. It's also maxim maximally specialized, meaning each aspect of the system, um, which you'll see more of in a minute, um, the timing of the irrigation, the timing of planting, the timing of moving the ducks off the patties, the timing of weeding, it's all specialized and very specific and done at particular times to produce maximum possible output in terms of fertility and crop production. Also, these fields are continuously cultivated. So there's no fallow, um, they're continuously managed during each cycle of growth, whether that's planting or harvesting or fallow. Um, there's always stuff going on on the patties related to uh, maintaining the fertility, maintaining the system. And within this system, soil fertility here has been maintained, possibly even increased for thousands of years. Um, one reason for this is because nutrients are continually being created and recycled back into the system just because of the way it's set up, right, polyculture. And there's two keys to make this work. One, there has to be exact and extremely precise timing of irrigation, i.e. when people decide to water their field. One reason for this is that in Bali, all the water that's used to water the rice paddies is landlocked on the inside of the island. And that means there's only so much for everyone to irrigate with. If everyone irrigates at the exact same time, there's not enough water. And so they have, they're organized into these different um, things called subaks, sort of collections of a number of households are organized into these subaks. And one subak will plant then two weeks later, the next one downhill will plant and so on. 
And then that first subak that planted first will irrigate, let the water into their fields. And a couple of weeks later, they will let that drain and let that water irrigate the next subaks down and so on down the mountainside. And in this way, the way that irrigation is precisely timed and also staggered so that everyone's not watering at the same time, this is the only way to make sure there's enough water for all of the rice fields. So very precise timing of irrigation techniques, which ends up, as you'll see in a minute, being tied into the society's religion. And also lots and lots of labor is required to do this. Again, if you take the people out of the equation, these beautiful terraced hillsides will turn into a muddy slope in about a week or two. And so just to show you a little more about how this is done, you can see the rice-based terrace uh, field on the slide, you have these tiny mud diked flooded rice fields. Um, so you see these sort of sections on the hillside um, that are terraced and then flooded and the water's kept in by the dikes that they build. They can also grow crops on the dikes um, when the fields are, are flooded or when they're dry. Um, each year the patties have to be drained and rebuilt. So you have to, again, continually be managing this uh, to keep it working. It'll turn in, into a muddy slope within a few days if you don't. Um, and it's also important to drain the patties each year because of pest control, which we'll come back to here in a minute. Uh, the rice initially is planted in moist ground. Then once it grows to about a foot tall, the patty has to be flooded, and then later it's drained for harvest. And so again, there's several of these mountainsides, uh, several different subacs and households within each subac that need water to grow their crops. But if everyone waters at the same time, there won't be enough. So it has to be staggered. And that makes the control and timing of the water absolutely crucial. Within this system, over time, the fertility of the paddy has been either maintained or even increased. Um, this is not true for industrial farming systems, right? We have to constantly add fertilizer to our system just to keep growing crops out of the degraded soil. Also, you can grow other crops like wheat um, or other things in the paddy when it's dry, or if the paddy is flooded, you can grow other crops on the dikes, those sort of, um, you can see them in the picture, those dry areas on the field. And also fish live in the ponds and the canals, ducks live near the paddies. So the fish and the ducks all eat pests. They also defecate into the water and the soil all to uh, get rid of pests and also contribute further fertility to the soil. And other organic fertilizers are also added to these fields to increase fertility. Um, one example is something called night soil. Um, and for those of you that are not sure what night soil is, uh, it is what it is is human human waste, human feces. And it's called night soil because in different Asian civilizations, um, in, in China, for example, there's a picture of a statue of a famous night soiler on the slide. Um, people would come around to pick up human waste at night. So it was called night soil. Um, and this can be really dangerous. Don't practice this at home. Um, using human waste to fertilize soil can be really dangerous because if not enough time goes by, um, disease carrying parasites like parasitic worms will will still be alive in the feces and then this can infect and hurt people and so it has to be buried underground a lot of time has to pass in order for it to kill the dangerous parasites but when you come post night soil night soil properly it creates fertile soil just teeming with beneficial micronutrients um, and so this was also added to the fields to create even further fertility. And this is the reason that the fertility of the field has been not only maintained, but even increased over time. So some key attributes of this system, it's labor intensive. Again, you need people, you need warm bodies to get this done. It can't be done with machines and chemicals. Um, with that said, it's highly, highly productive. Um, so, so remember Bozerip talked about uh, less people can actually be an impediment to environmental restoration and and whatnot and so 
Bozerup said more people can actually be a good thing um, because it equals more hands, more minds, more knowledge, and therefore more innovation. And so in this case, uh, rice-based polyculture, again, it can't be done without people. More, more people in this case is what, is what has created a successful, fertile system that's highly, highly productive, produces uh, high yields each year. So remember, there's two paths to agricultural intensification, growing more food, uh, hierarchy and centralization, as we've seen in the U.S. and among the classic Maya, or uh, small, self-sufficient households, as we see um, the Maya shifted to and also in rice-based polyculture. Um, but again, it requires high population densities and also specific environments. So to compare rice-based polyculture with U.S. industrial agriculture, um, rice-based polyculture is a form of intensive agriculture. So remember, there's two paths to producing more food. Intensification, where on the same amount of land, you put more effort into that plot of land to get more food out of it. And extensification, instead of intensifying your efforts on the same plot of land, you extensify to get more food. You grow on more land, you spread out, you extensify. So intensification, put more effort onto the same plot of land to get more food. Extensification, spread out, plant more land to get more food. These are two different strategies. And so rice-based polyculture is intensive. You get very high yields of rice and other crops on a very small amount of land. Um, this is possible because they maximize the productivity of the land by mimicking natural ecosystems. They use irrigation, terracing, night soil to get more food out of the same land. They intensify their efforts. This is in contrast to the U.S. agriculture um, where we are, we have extensified. Right? We grow more food by spreading out, at least initially. Um, we get high yields on a large amount of land. Note the U.S. also now practices, in, practices intensive agriculture. We use fertilizer, other chemical inputs to get more output out of that same unit of land. Um, Rice-based polyculture is labor intensive. It takes someone working 50 days to cultivate one acre in this system. It requires people. Um, in contrast, U.S. agriculture is mechanized. It take what takes one person 50 days to do in rice-based polyculture takes one person two to three hours to do per acre in U.S. ag. Remember, it's all riding tractors and spraying, as Pullen says. Rice-based polyculture is technologically simple. Um, the farmers don't need to rely on scientists or Monsanto to buy their seed. It's simple digging sticks, plows, hoes, um, simple technology, but the farmers are highly skilled, highly knowledgeable about their local environment, and they know different special techniques um, for the timing of irrigation, for the planting of the rice, for the moving the ducks off the paddy um, at the right time. Uh, it's highly, highly intricate ecological knowledge of how it works in each field. This is in contrast to U.S. agriculture. It's not, it's technologically focused, not simple, right? So farmers can't really farm by themselves. They rely on companies and industries and scientists to tell them what seed to use, what chemicals to put on those seeds, um, their tractors, their machines, right? And this makes farmers essentially dependent on scientists, not just for technology, but even these days, just for the seed to grow our food. Most of it is patented. Rice-based polyculture. Farmers in this system are self-sufficient. They are growing for themselves for the, to feed their families, maybe to, to trade a little bit in the village. Their, their incentives are not to produce a bunch of food for sale on the market. This is in contrast to U.S. agriculture. Uh, the farmers aren't growing for their own livelihoods. They aren't, well, they're not to eat, right? They're not growing their own food. Um, they're growing for sale on the market, and it makes farmers reliant on on markets so that if what they're growing, say corn or soy, say the, pl the price on the market collapses, the farmers totally screwed out of their livelihood. This is what happened in 2019 via the trade war that Trump started with China. China buys a ton of our farmers soy. China said, you want to start a trade war? Okay, we're not going to buy any more of your soy. And Trump and his administration ended up spending $16 billion dollars just on soy farmers to bail them out because no one in the market was buying soy. Um, so it's a problem for the farmer, it's a problem for societies as a whole. Um, 
right? If the incentives are to grow for the market, that's different than growing for yourself. And there's also, when you're growing for the market, there's an incentive to grow just as much as possible because that means more profit. That also usually means more environmental degradation. In Lastly, in rice-based polyculture, they use energy inputs really efficiently. Um, think about the night soil, the irrigation, and we're going to watch a TED Talk in a minute that shows how it works in Bali. So you'll actually see what I've been trying to explain to you. In contrast, industrial ag, extremely inefficient use of energy inputs. It takes anywhere from 8 to 12 calories of energy to produce one calorie of food, not because of human labor, but because of all the non-human energy inputs, the fossil fuels, the fertilizer, the herbicides, the pesticides, the chemicals. So in both cases, you can produce a lot of food for large populations. Um, they're both reflective of complex societies, but on the one hand, one system is far more sustainable uh, than the other. Also remember that the particular environment in which human populations develop influences the particular culture that they'll have. Um, this is the materialist approach, right? The way in which people adapt to their environment via the material forces, the, the economy, subsistence, technology, economic relations, this will shape and drive the rest of the society. So in this vein, we can say all intensive agriculture in a way relies on a narrow set of species. Um, for us, either corn or soy or wheat in rice-based polyculture, um, they're growing more than just one monocrop, but it still is inherently less resilient than a naturally occurring ecosystem. We inherently simplify it because we're growing only the things we want, and it therefore makes it, <coughs> excuse me, less resilient, less diversified, right? That diversification, that redundancy that's built into natural ecosystems, there's not as much of that. So it makes them much less resilient than other forms of human subsistence like Sweden had horticulture slash and burn or hunting and gathering where, for example, like people among the Kung hunter gatherers, they're not really modifying their environment at all. They're simply living off of what it provides. And so there's a trade off. We've made our environments less resilient, our systems less resilient through relying on intensive agriculture. But the trade-off is we can produce more food, we can support more people, we can increase carrying capacity, at least for now. And so remember uh, the materialist approach that I just mentioned, these specific adaptations developed in response to the environment. Rice-based polyculture developed where land was really scarce, um, there wasn't room to spread out, but labor was cheap. And so you intensify you use the same plot of land, but put more labor, more effort into it to get more food. In the U.S., agriculture developed where land was cheap, um, it, namely because we, we stole and appropriated most of it for ourselves from the Native Americans. Land was cheap and labor was expensive. People's wages were high. And so instead of hiring a lot of people to farm in the same area, you spread out. You use a lot of land and not a lot of people to grow a bunch of food. Um, so two different paths to intensification, um, to growing more food, right? Intensification and extensification both inherently simplify the ecosystem. And so the reason we're talking about rice-based polyculture in Indonesia is to show you an example of another way, uh, an example of resource management of farming that doesn't necessarily result in environmental degradation, but can still support a large number of people. Um, there was a film made about rice-based polyculture in Bali, Indonesia in 1988 called The Goddess and the Computer. And I used to show the film in class. Um, I don't anymore because it's just sort of out of date and degraded, but if you're interested, here's the links. And what the film is about is about this system, rice-based polyculture, and how the whole system is predicated on the people's religion, which is related to the water goddess and the water temple. So as I was saying, water is landlocked in Bali. And so the only way to make sure everyone has enough water is to stagger the timing of the irrigation so that the fields on top irrigate first. Um, the fields or the subex below wait a few weeks, then they irrigate. Um, the fields below them wait a few weeks, then they irrigate. And in this way in which irrigation is staggered, there's enough water for everyone. Also, 
if you irrigate all the fields at the same time and grow the rice in the same stage all at the same time, it's really easy for pests and diseases to attack your crop. So also by staggering the irrigation and the timing of the growth of each field, it also helps to control for pest infestations. Um, there's, there's all these benefits uh, that come from the way in which this, the farming system is tied into the religion. And so each subak is organized around um, the sort of the water temple and the water goddess. That's what determines the timing of when the water is released. And again, it's released differently down the hill uh, in a staggered order so that there's enough water for everyone. What happens in Goddess and the Computer is um, Steve Lansing, an anthropologist and also an ecologist, are trying to build a computer simulation, a model to show the Balinese government how important the religion, the Subak system, which controls the timing of the irrigation, how important that religion is to the farming system in Bali. What had happened at this time is uh, the Green Revolution had been exported into Bali. And the, the, the way they sell it is here, grow these, uh, grow these seeds, use these chemical fertilizers and, and pesticides, and you'll be able to grow way more food. You'll be able to sell that on the market. This will increase your economic well-being. This will make everyone in Bali more well off, right? Make create economic um, development and profit, and that will trickle down and help the whole society. And so they do, they import the Green Revolution to Bali. And what it does is it totally destroys the system. Um, they already don't need fertilizer because the soil is already fertile. So when they start dumping fertilizer on their fields, it doesn't get absorbed by the plants. It runs off into the freshwater and eventually the oceans, creating these hypoxic dead zones that essentially are killing the, the coral, coral reef systems and the marine ecosystems off the coast of Bali. They're just dead, dying, still happening, even though... Um, People have tried to reverse the damage the Green Revolution has done. And so the, this computer model was developed to try to show government officials and scientists and outside experts involved in exporting the Green Revolution to Bali that they're, they're, the religion is key and to ignore it is to the detriment of the whole system. Um, so what we're going to do is we're not going to watch the film The Goddess and the Computer. But we are going to watch a TED Talk by Stephen Lansing, who was in the computer, the Goddess in the Computer film. And he's the anthropologist that went over there and sort of did some of this stuff. So we're going to watch this TED Talk, and Steve Lansing is going to tell you about the Subak system in rice-based polyculture in Indonesia. Um, so what you're going to do, go ahead and pause the lecture, and then type this URL, the link for the TED Talk, into your browser exactly it needs to be exact and then go ahead and watch steve T uh, steve lansing's ted talk it's about 15 minutes long it'll show you and tell you some of what i've been talking about in terms of bali and also how the importation of the green revolution um, poised really to destroy the whole system that had been successful and sustainable for thousands and thousands of years so go ahead pause the lecture um, watch the 15 minute TED talk via this link that you're going to type into your browser. And then after you've watched the TED talk, go ahead and come back and join me for the last few minutes of lecture. Okay, so hopefully you watched the TED talk. Um, and so you can see some of the consequences of the importation of the Green Revolution into Bali. Uh, the system was already sustainable. The soil was already fertile. They didn't need fertilizer. Um, the addition of the fertilizer actually degraded and destroyed entire parts of their ecosystem. Um, the traditional system actually worked quite better, um, but it, the damage had already been done, right? The Green Revolution had already been imported. And you have farmers that are still dumping fertilizer on their fields, um, even though they've been told they don't need to. And that fertilizer is not being absorbed by the plants. It has to go somewhere. It ends up going into the freshwater systems, eutrophying our marine ecosystems, creating toxic algae blooms, and destroying all other marine life in those zones. So important takeaways uh, from the TED Talk and the example of Bali. Uh, in this case, 
the importation of the Green Revolution, Western scientists brought a huge bias with them. They essentially came in, imposed their own Western development schemes um, to the detriment of the local system, right? They assumed religion, the water goddess, the water temples was not an important component of the farming system. And yet it's absolutely essential. It's key to the timing of irrigation, which is what the whole system is predicated on. Um, this is what we call paternalism. Um, outsiders, typically powerful Westerners, come in to other cultures, typically non-Western, less powerful ones, and impose their own concepts, their own ideas of what these people need and should do, and then put it into practice in their projects. The result is often a, a lot of wasted effort a lot of wasted resources and a lot of failed projects that don't actually help the beneficiaries that they set out to help. It highlights the importance of holism in anthropology, right? Anthropology emphasizes we have to understand how the parts are interrelated. How do the parts form the whole? You cannot look at just one part, say farming, without understanding and considering how it's interrelated to the other parts, say in this case, religion, right? The parts are all interrelated and we have to understand this if we're to actually understand what's going on. Think about it. If you're trying to understand how a car works, what do you look at? Do you look at the wheels, which seem to be important? Do you look at the steering wheel? Do you look at the frame? Um, do you look at the engine? And not any single one of those would answer your question. You have to look at all the parts and how they fit together to understand how the whole system works. And so development, what we saw in the TED Talk and the failed importation of the Green Revolution, this highlights a lot of problems with development and conservation and aid projects that are imposed often by outsiders. Um, it's what we call top-down versus bottom-up planning. So a team of outsider scientists, economic experts, development planners will develop um, aid or conservation or develop economic development projects and then try to implement them in other places. This is called top-down planning. The planning comes from the top and is implemented downwards onto the community. This is really problematic. It doesn't take into account the local knowledge or needs or desires of the local community. Maybe you're trying to import a project that people don't even want. Um, or maybe you're importing the Green Revolution with this idea that, oh, this will help this people, these people, and it completely destroys their ecosystem and their farming system. Um, Top-down planning is prevalent, um, but extremely problematic. They always carry this bias. There's a, in top-down planning, there's a bias towards Western scientific thought that science sort of has all the answers and whatever you're doing, we can do it better right? Paternalism, we know best. Um, or this assumption, for example, that how could religion possibly be related to rice production or irrigation in Bali? Um, it is. It's incredibly interrelated. So this lack of knowledge of local context or the failure to try to understand local socio sociocultural context results in many failed or only partially successful projects. Um, in the film, um, The Goddess in the Computer, that we didn't watch, there's a there's an example of uh, outside planners talking about, well, we don't we don't want to hire an anthropologist to come in and see what the people might need or what the local context is all about because that's expensive. Well, the multi-million dollar dam they built in part of their Green Revolution project was also very expensive. Um, and it also didn't help the people, it made things worse off. Um, so a lot of people would argue, you know, have an anthropologist as an advocate or a liaison or someone to go in and do the groundwork to actually talk to the people that are supposedly supposed to benefit from these projects. Because a lot of times they don't and it leaves them frustrated and even further disenfranchised. Um, development projects and aid projects, they're often well-intentioned, but they don't have a holistic perspective and they result in a lot of failed, wasted resources and effort. Um, so just a couple examples from my own work. On the slide here, that gentleman's name is Sam, um, and that's a picture from Titiana in Solomon Islands. And so one of the, there was different NGOs on all the different islands, and the NGO that worked on Giza was Oxfam. And so Oxfam came in and their whole plan was to, to rebuild housing. And I interviewed um, the main project guy for Oxfam on Giza, really nice guy, he was a construction guy. And I said, well, how'd you guys know to build houses for people? And his answer was, well, we just knew. 
We could tell that's what they needed. We knew. No elaboration, never asked a single person what they wanted or what they needed. They just knew. Also, because of some failures of Oxfam's initial project, um, it, the story's more complicated than I'm going to tell you here, they ended up, instead of rebuilding houses for people in Titiana and Pailange and on Gizo, um, so there's like 14, 15 villages on the island, they, instead of rebuilding because they didn't have enough, they gave people partial building materials. And then the idea was take these and you can rebuild your own house. It was called an empowerment plan, right? Not only give people the resources to rebuild, but let them do it themselves. Um, it will empower them. They can feel good about themselves. What a lovely fucking idea. That sounds great on paper. Probably got a bunch of funding from outsiders. Um, how many of you know how to build a fucking house? Yeah, me neither. And a lot of people in Titian and Pailange also didn't know how to build a house. And so you end up with these partial building materials. Many people couldn't even use them because they didn't know how to build. Sam actually kind of did know how to build. Um, he, This is what he started with the materials he was given. Um, but eventually he had to abandon that. It still looks like that today because the wood Oxfam gave him was completely rotten. Um, it was already rotted. It couldn't be used to build a house. Um, another example, there was a, a Signola, this man, Titiana Villager, I was interviewing one day. And also being a white girl walking around Solomon Islands, a lot of people think that I'm an NGO worker, which I was not. I'm an anthropologist. And so I kind of have to explain that. But they still kind of think I know about like the aid they got and what else might be coming. So I get a lot of questions about that. And Signola, I was interviewing him. And he asked me, he said, you know, kind of got on, you know, why did the NGOs do this or that? And I do my best to explain, but again, that's not, you know, I wasn't part of the NGOs. I wouldn't have done it that way. And he says, you know, they gave us, they gave us spoons. They get, one of the things that the NGOs replaced because everyone lost everything. It was just completely washed away was like kitchen utensils and cups, right? They just, they're just replacing stuff. Um, but not, they weren't asking people what they needed. They were just deciding, oh, here's kitchen utensils. You lost them. So you obviously need more. And Signola asked me, said, why did they give us spoons? I can't feed my family with a spoon. And I love sort of the double entendre of that. I can't feed my family with a spoon. Why didn't they ask us what we wanted? Um, I can feed my family with a canoe. He said, I can go out, I can take that canoe, I can go fishing, I can feed my family the fish, I can take some of that fish and sell it in the market and buy some rice. I said, I can't feed my family with a spoon, I can feed my family with a canoe. I can, I can build my house with a canoe, I can't build my house with a spoon. With a canoe, I can go out, fish, after I feed my family, I can sell some of that fish in the market for a little bit of corrugated iron, a little bit of timber. I can slowly rebuild my house with that. I can rebuild my house with a canoe. I can feed my family with a canoe. I can't do that with a spoon. Why didn't they ask us what we needed, what we wanted? And this is a common pitfall of Western imposed, imposed development aid and conservation projects. Powerful outsiders come in, impose their own paternalistic ideas of what people need, and they're often wrong. And it results in all this wasted effort and really, really frustrated locals that continually are told and think help is coming and it never, ever comes. <clears throat> There was another example, uh, one other example from Solomon Islands in Pailange, the other main village I work in, worked in. Uh, they, the Papua New Guinea Salvation Army, so the Salvation Army, but based in Papua New Guinea, donated 15 wooden houses with labor included. This is like the Ritz Carlton of the village, a like wooden house with a rain tank with labor included. That's a fucking mansion. And they donate, so they built 15 houses with labor on the hill in Pailange village, one for each household in this small enclave of the village. And do you know how many people are living there now? Almost none. Because Pailange villagers don't live on the hill. It takes about a half hour to climb up the hill by digging your big toe into the muddy hillside and hoping it doesn't slip back out. Um, by the time to go get water, you got to go down the hill and back up 45 minutes later, you've dropped most of the water you went to carry, um, you're covered in mud. It's, it's difficult. People fish, they garden, they don't do this on the hill. They do it down by the seaside. And so they do not live on the hill. Um, it'd be kind of like me offering you, you go to school at SDSU. Cool. Well, Hey, I got you a one bedroom apartment in Orange County, you know, great, but I can't fucking use it. 
Um, and so the NGO, the Salvation Army, came in and said their whole plan, their whole paternalistic idea was, oh, well, we're going to build back better. And so we're not going to rebuild their houses by the sea where they live. Um, we're going to build them on top of the hill so that if a tsunami ever happens again, it won't wipe out the village. Well, guess what? No one lives up there because that's not where they live. Um, NGOs, outsiders come in with good intentions most of the time but they do not actually help most of the time. So much wasted effort and resources because people don't bother to find out the local social context they're working in, and they don't bother to ask people, the beneficiaries of their project, what they actually want and need, right? They assume that they know, top-down planning. It's a non-holistic perspective, uh, and it's extremely problematic, results in a lot of wasted resources. <clears throat> okay, so, um, that's, that's it sort of for, for the material for today. Um, one other thing I'll say, you started reading this book, Nature and Culture at Lake Titicaca, Lines in the Water, uh, by Ben Orlove. And so stick with it. It's not a textbook. It's an ethnography. It's a story about the fishing villages, an ethnographic story about the fishing villages around Lake Titicaca. The reason we're reading it is it's a really great example of an alternative to sort of top-down, externally imposed resource management policies and schemes. In the book, it's an example of what we call community-based resource management in which control over the resources, over the environment, is actually maintained by the local resource users rather than the government or scientists or outside economic powers. The locals actually retain control and in the face of a lot of external pressures, um, other powerful actors, the government, the military, powerful commercial interests coming in, trying to wrestle control of the resources from the villagers. And so it's a it's a cool, unique example of long term sustainable resource use that's been maintained in the face of change over the last several decades, uh, last couple centuries. It's an alternative to top-down conservation policy, um, again, called community-based resource management. So start, just start reading it, start getting into it, and we'll talk more about um, how it fits into the class next week and also after the second exam. Um, so with that, I hope you all have a fantastic day and our next topic is continuing in this thread of sustainability across cultures and through time, um, but we'll be moving away from complex societies um, into horticultural societies in the Amazon on Thursday. So we'll look at another example um, and what can we learn from them, if anything. All right, have a great day. See ya.